change and transforming HR in the life sciences. Today, it, this session is being hosted by Bearing Point and Talent Team. What I'll do now is I'll briefly introduce the presenters today, and then we'll do a, an introduction to Talent Team and Bearing Point as organizations. So firstly, a little bit about myself. Hello, my name is Edith Cormican. I'm from Bearing Point's People Transformation Team here in Bearing Point, Ireland. So I'd have about 20 years experience doing all kinds of HR systems transformations with a particular focus on SAP, HR, payroll and success factors. I'm, to I'm joined today by Tony Devine from Talent Team. Hi, Toby. Hi there. Morning. You're right, Edith. Um, yes, so Toby Devine, I am relatively new at Talent Team, uh, but I've been working in the HR technology space for over seven years now. Um, I am the alliances and sales manager here. Uh, we become clearer what I do when I do uh, introduce Talent Team uh, very shortly. But um, over, to, uh, over to Lionel, who's, who's our guest speaker today. Hi, thanks, Toby. Hello, everyone. I'm Lionel Lubyshevsky. Um, I'm the director of the learning platforms at GSK. So um, today I'm going to, uh, to walk you through our experience with our learning platforms and, and, and you know, what we recently deployed. Um, that, was, that was really giving a, a beautiful user experience to, uh, to all of our users across the world in, in those times of, uh, of COVID and, and, uh, and, and well, challenges working together. So more to come later. I'm really delighted to be with you today. Excellent. Thank you, Lionel. Uh, nice to meet, meet everyone also. Um, so I'm going to move on um, and introduce uh, Talent Team. So um, we are a learning and talent consultancy um, and specialize in human capital management or HR technology uh, with a pure dedicated focus to the SAP Success Factors solution, which is um, a global um, or globally leading end-to-end -end cloud HR technology or, or human capital management solution. Um, as a business, we've got seven, over 17 years of dedicated experience delivering solutions um, to the life sciences sector and uh, have de uh, developed some really interesting uh, package solutions to suit businesses of all shapes and sizes. Um, we have an international presence um, with our largest office being here in the UK. Um, also, we have offices and teams in the Middle East and in, uh, and in Asia. Um, over to you, Edith. Thanks, Toby. Uh, so then just in terms of Bearing Point, Bearing Point is a management and IT consultancy company. We've got a, a sizable presence here in Ireland, but also right across Europe. We're focused on technology as an, a, an enabler for business transformation. And we're a systems integrator. So I suppose what that mean, typically means is when we help organizations by taking a prime role in projects, often bringing together like multiple parties to deliver an overall solution. Um, so, and that solution could be any kind of technology really, but we have a particular specialism in HR systems. So the kind of thing that myself and my team do would be looking at business cases for HR, HR technology, uh, helping our clients through vendor selections, absolutely the implementation of that technology, and then going on to help them with their ongoing support and sometimes their help with, the, with their vendor management. So, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, well first of all, we'll kick off by looking at uh, the challenges and the opportunities facing the life science industry right at the moment. Um, we, and we look at how that impacts HR and, and the demands placed on our people services. Change aspects will be will be key to, to, to what I'm talking about in particular this morning. Um, and, um, and I'll share some of my tips uh, and tricks that I've learned over the years in, in, on that topic. Uh, then we'll hand over to Toby, who will describe how success factors can help you meet those challenges and demands that are being placed um, on, on the organizations. And then we'll pass over to Lionel, who'll bring us through GSK's experience of transforming their learning through, H through success factors. So we'll go on now and we'll talk just a little bit about the forces of change in the life sciences at the moment. I mean, well, first of all, there's this, the speed, right? The, the, this increased pressure to deliver diagnostics and therapies to the market uh, quicker all the time it is, has been a trend for quite a few years, but like we haven't seen the, the case of COVID uh, makes this an unprecedented case of that. Um, secondly, I would say, I suppose, supply chain. Uh, the risk is 
absolutely central to everything in the life sciences. But what recently unforeseen events, obviously COVID, but also like in recent years, we've seen the Fukushima disaster and even Storm Ophelia. They put a spotlight on the governance and the risk management of, of the supply of raw materials, I'd say, uh, but also the market distribution of the products. Then in terms of the communications technology. So, I mean, like that's um, changing all the time. You might say, ah, look, we've had video calls for a few years now, and that's true. But the, the enhanced user experience now means that it's so much more accessible to people that may not have used it in the past. So like, I mean, how many of us would have thought that we'd see our elderly relatives making um, video calls unassisted? Um, personally, I think it's gonna be really, really interesting to see um, how much pressure there is from, from that part of the population um, to have much more their medical appointments via video and um, and I suppose it's in particularly true for those who live in, in rural areas. Um, now, this adoption of, of advanced communication technology not just impacts patients, but it also impacts our people. So, so our people are so used to getting that really, really good consumer grade technology experience in their daily lives. So like, I mean, why would they not expect to get that same level of, of user experience when they're at work? The other big, big, big uh, trend that, that's happening at the moment. I mean, we all know about, you know, big data, AI, personalized medicine, and the potential of collaboration in this area is just absolutely fascinating to watch in terms of, the, of what's happening around COVID in particular. Um, um, on the other side as well, we, we're also seeing automation. So that automation, automation applies to, yes, absolutely the production line and automation advances there. But what we're seeing in the last two or three years, the automation in the back office function is also a really very significant. So how is this affecting HR and our people services? So first of all, I mean, I don't think I need to tell you about the, the big changes in terms of remote working. But like it has to be said, this, this was a very strong trend uh, long before COVID. So, I mean, back in 2019, a, COVID, uh, a CIPD survey found that uh, about 73% of people want to work more from home. Um, and, and we have to remember that working from home is not just giving people a VPN connection and access to their email. I mean, it's very important that they're able to do all their processes remotely. And that, that applies to both staff and the HR professionals. They, they need to be able to work really efficiently um, and in real time. Uh, but for me, I think that, that informal communication and collaboration that happens when people are physically together, it, it, we need to be very, very careful that that is not lost when people are working in such a dispersed um, situation. Second big trend is flexible working. Again, we're seeing uh, big pressures uh, for employers to provide much more flexibility in terms of the number of hours that people work, um, but also in their working patterns. But interesting, there's an, another side to that flexible working. With this demand for this speed of delivery, what we're really seeing is that's impacting organizational structures within um, the life sciences. So I suppose, in years gone by, you know, organizations could print up a chart of their organizational structure and stick it on the wall. I mean, those days are long, long gone. And nowadays we're seeing much, much more of that trend of project focused um, teams. So uh, often people are asked to be flexible and to jump onto a project to make up a part of a multidisciplinary team that might pull in um, subject matter experts, both from across your own location, but across the other global presence um, of that organization. Um, so so they, the, the solutions that are, that, that are recording this information need to be much, much more flexible in terms of how you can record your organizational structure, and in particular, those dotted line reporting um, structures are really important. In terms of remote learning, obviously it goes hand in hand with the remote working. Um, the, the, there really is a demand for, again, that consumer grade experience available over mobile, especially for, um, for some of our people that may not have a, a company owned device. Um, the, the demand is that they, people want access immediately. They don't want a situation they had in the past where tra the training department ran a course once a month 
And if you wanted to do the course, you needed to wait a month until that course has been run again. Uh, people are expecting as well that when they when they log into their learning solution, that it's a personalized content, that it's based on their role in the organization. Um, and it clearly lays out what their mandatory content that they must complete is and what their recommended content is. They also want to be involved in social learning. So um, they want to learn from their peers, the content that their, 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 that their colleagues and their, their peers are sharing can be really, really um, important to them. Um, and it can be very uh, specific to their role. We also need to bear in mind here that, that content management is very, very important. Um, and, and there is that constant challenge in making sure that your SOPs are up to date um, and your, your solution remains validated. Just in terms of the skills now, this is interesting as well. Like this is a, a very significant shift is happening here. I suppose like what we're seeing for the life sciences, you know, the, the, the skill sets that are required to, to support that, that new trends in what's happening means that there's a bit of bad news here, right? What we're doing here is we're targeting the very same skills that are in very high demand. We're looking for data scientists, data analysts, we're also looking for user experience specialists because we need them to um, provide that, um, that consumer grade experience into those med tech solutions that we need. Now, on the other side of, of, of things, though, you know, the downturn in the economy has meant a significant loosening of demand in other areas, not specific to life sciences now. That means that, you know, so the number of applications that we're seeing coming through uh, in some roles has gone up very, very dramatically. And we've got a new challenge now then in terms of finding the most talented people in those particular pools. Lastly, I think it's really interesting, the employee value proposition. I mean, Mercer did, uh, did a study in the last, just the last few weeks, actually, and they found that 37% of employees were motivated by strong corporate values, mission and purpose. So for me, that's really interesting because we're seeing now how life sciences are seen as a, actually a very attractive employer, uh, even more so than in the past, because they're seen as being highly innovative and, and I suppose they're being seen as making the world a better place, which makes them very attractive to certain groups of employees. So, um, so what we might do now is just go on and talk a little bit about, about HR systems projects, right? So, I mean, I started doing HR systems projects back in the late 1990s, um, and the projects looked a lot like the, the chart on the left, okay? So it was like 70% technology, okay? So that, that was the real focus. You can see there that I would say people and change probably made up about 10% of the overall project effort. And to be honest, uh, at times as well, you know, I, I saw that 10% squeezed down even more um, when, when push came to shove. But I suppose the advent of cloud has changed all that. It used to be that we, like organizations would be asked, well, what do you need the system to do? And then the solution was built to those requirements. So that would have involved some very hardcore um, configuration and some coding around that. Um, but with cloud technology, the approach is very, very different. The processes are built into the solution and best practice processes, okay? So the approach there is that the organization is signing up to these best practices um, and you're asked, it is possible to tweak them around the edges um, and to do things like brand them to make sure that they tie in with the overall experience. Um, but it does mean that the organization needs to change and transform. Now, this is actually a good thing because oftentimes the processes that are in place are not best practice. But like that kind of true transformation, like it doesn't just happen overnight. You know, it does require an awful lot of effort. Um, and it's good actually nowadays, I really see that, that organizations understand that. They've seen projects go off the rails, so they know how important it is. Um, so that's why I'd say nowadays we're looking at probably about 50% of the effort that goes into these projects is around that change and um, transformation, everything got to do with people. So um, we might talk a little bit now about, about change in general. And I suppose um, I might just talk a little bit of my experience of change um, and what I felt, feel tends to, tends to work well. So first of all, the leadership, right? 
you absolutely need them uh, behind you. So their role will be to coordinate and to facilitate. And let's face it, ultimately, they will decide the priorities for the organization when it comes to the crunch, like where will the resources be allocated? Will they be there for your project or they, do they need to get pulled onto something else? That's really important that they understand the importance of, of, of the program. So we need to articulate the case for change as well. So in the past, like I would have seen that, you know, you'd have a business case document where, where a lot of thought may have been given at given to, to, to why the, the budget should be allocated to the project, but oftentimes that might sit on the shelf. That can't happen, right? That's not a good thing. What you need to do instead is you need to take your stakeholders, right? You need to make a very long list of who all your stakeholders are. And that's not just confined to your employees. You've got your employees, but within your employees, there's lots of different subsets within those employees. You need to identify who all those different groups are um, you also need to consider your external contractors and any external organizations. Then you need to think about what, how this transformation, and I'm not just talking about the system here now, I'm talking about the overall process, um, is going to impact those people. You need to talk about how it's actually going to impact them, and then you need to think about how they perceive that it's going to impact them. So, and that's really, really worthwhile. You'll keep coming back to that throughout the program. Um, but just when we're on stakeholders, you, from day one, you need to engage with risk and compliance and data governance. You need, you need them with you every step of the way, right? And so I would always, always in, um, recommend reaching out to them from the very, very start. So then just in terms of the different stakeholders and how you communicate them to them, it's really important that you have a communications plan, again, written down on a page, in that, it should list off the different um, communications that you plan to make at the different times. It talks about the channel of the communication. Is it, is it an all hands or a town hall meeting? Is it an email? How is it a poster if you're back in the physical building? You need to have the dates against it and you need the key messages, literally the draft messages, the text of the email or whatever it is. And when you're doing that the whole time, you need to keep in the forefront of your mind what is it that you want the, those people to do or think differently after they've seen your message? And lastly, I suppose what we, what we need to do then is, is constantly reinforce those messages. All the hard work that went into your stakeholder analysis, that went into your communications plan, you need to keep pulling that out and re-engaging with your stakeholders over the, over the coming months and years. So that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Toby now. And what Toby's going to do is give us an insight into success factors and how success factors can support some of those demands, some of us, support us on some of those demands that are being placed on us. Thanks, Toby. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Yeah, that really resonates. That, um, like, uh, like Edith said, I'm going to move on now to uh, talk more about SAP success factors that uh, really enables that, uh, that, that change and, and transformation. Um, so we'll start a little bit about SAP success factors. As I previously mentioned in the introduction, um, it is a globally leading end-to-end -end, um, HR technology solution. Being a globally leading solution, um, you'd expect some really, really impressive stats, which, uh, which we can see here. I mean, over 6,500 customers uh, globally across 26 industries, um, being obviously a, a big highlight in, in supporting um, organizations with localized support in over 90 countries um, we're obviously talking about you know real real market leader here um, there, here's some more um, stats around uh, around customer benefits however um, around faster hiring we're going to talk a little bit about hiring the hiring process um, shortly um, and uh, ultimately give you a little bit of a view of what success factors um, does in, in terms of functionality, in terms of enabling that, that process. So it is a real, it really is a solution where you can start anywhere and, and go anywhere with it. I mean, if there's a particular um, area of focus or need that is a priority for the organization to, to address um, quicker or um, as, as, number, as the number one issue, um, we can highlight any of these key areas in, um, in, in, this, uh, in this image here. 
Um, but I'm going to go into um, a brief demonstration or overview um, of success factors now for you. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go into the system for you now. Here we go. Here is the success factors home screen or landing page. Um, before I start the demo, um, everything that I'm going to show you today is available on mobile, uh, just to let you know. Um, so the landing page itself has a lot of uh, tiles, um, shortcuts, quick actions available. We're looking at this from a manager's point of view, hence um, performance reviews, uh, approval requests for, um, for my team uh, section here. News, uh, the news feed is pretty self-explanatory, but organizations can um, place any, any type of news information they want in there. Relevant to, relevant to the business for employees to have a view of. Um, if we scroll down and look at the My Info section, um, that's where we can view org charts with the, within the business, book holiday and the time off area. Um, of course, there's many, many tiles here. Therefore, um, many more actions can be um, accessible and designed um, and the view can be edited with uh, role-based permissions uh, for the business. But let's start with recruiting um, as, a, as a module um, to, to focus on, okay? And now I'm in the recruiting module. Um, you can see the job requisitions or um, roles uh, that are available within the business. However, these with zero progress on are roles that are not yet posted. So if we click on one of these, um, you can see how a role is posted, what fields um, and details are needed and required to uh, post the role. Um, so here's all the fields, which is um, quite extensive as you can see. Um, then it can be posted um, internally and or externally. If we go back into the job requisitions um, and look at a role that is currently um, open. Um, so for example, the UX designer position here, you will be able to see the candidates that have, um, if we click on candidates tab here, we will be able to see the candidates that have been um, assigned or um, applied for the role, I should say. Um, and we have a, we have an offer. So here's the, the overall process um, and st steps throughout the, uh, the the recruiting process here, um, as you can see. Um, so the role um, will be um, posted out on external sites like LinkedIn. Indeed, there are all those types of integrations are in place with success factors. Um, you can also see. Um, and, and align uh, agencies to job requisitions, um, obviously specialist agencies, etc. See the pipeline um, of all the different roles and the status of all the different roles. Uh, there are many actions and shortcuts that can uh, that can be taken. Here, you can drag and, drag and drop the candidates to um, different stages throughout that um, that cycle that I just showed you there. Um, so. Now I'm going to move into the learning module. So um, here is the landing page for the learning module. So we can tap in um, any type of uh, any type of search here uh, for particular um, types of learning or competencies we want to focus on on learning. Um, the my curricula um, tile or dashboard uh, tab is is quite useful to show kind of status of of ongoing um, learning for, um, for for yourself um, features. This is more like. Uh, um, specific types uh, or courses um, that, are, that, are, that are deemed relevant as well as recommendations. They can be recommended by team members, peers, etc. And you can 
um, obviously do that and recommend any type of learning to anyone in the business. Um, but here's some assignments. Let, let's, have, let's have a look at an actual assignment, which is overdue, as, as you can see. Um, and there's a number of different methods that are used here, pull, pull and push methods uh, specifically. So the pull method being assigned to you and the push method um, is more like information sent to you by the, by um, assi assigned and pushed to, you, pushed to employees uh, by the organization. Okay. So if you were to complete this, actually this, um, this course is not currently available at the moment. But if enough people are requesting um, or recommending the course, I'm sure they'll, you know, some, something will be planned. So it's kind of showing the, the status and schedule of a, um, of a course right here. Before we go back to my learning. Um, and we go into my, the my teams section so we're looking at this from a from a manager point of view um, so as a manager you have visibility of your team uh, which you come up here here we go um, and the course is available to them um, so you have um, Jackie for example let's go let's go on Jackie um, she's doing a health and safety training course which is recommended, uh, which you can recommend to um, recommend to other uh, team members. Um, you can type their name in here. Uh, for example, obviously we can see Jacob is, is also in my team. So let's recommend that to, to Jacob and send that recommendation. Um, and as a manager, certain dashboards and reports um, are available as well um, on on the team i.e. who um, is doing what and who's overdue with uh, with what um, or completed so let's go back to my course my courses the next section um, so this tool is more used for trainers um, either internal or external trainers. You can see past courses um, that have been conducted here. Um, there's, um, you, you, can, you, can, you can see what you're actually authorized to conduct or to teach around training. Um, you can mark attendance um, here. Um, if we go to the scheduled, scheduled one, back to the scheduled courses, we can mark attendance, we can do things take things offline with rostering even um and record uh, record completion that way whatever process is um is, is better you know or, or more relevant for the organization so if we go back to the home page um we're going to change um to um charles charles has a different role within the business which will show some uh some interesting um, further functionality. So he's in a manager role. And we're going to look at it more from a um, more from a talent perspective. When it wakes up to say it's Charles. Yep, here we are. Um, so if we start in goals, for example, it's always a good place to start with uh, with, with goals setting goals um, for ourselves, our team. Um, so this is actually for, for himself, but we can see the status of various goals for himself and for team members as well, who's behind, who's uh, essentially tracking progress there. We can cascade goals to team members as well, um, assign learning courses here too, um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different things we can do here around around the goals piece. But if we look into more into the performance side of things, then um, and the we'll start with the team overview. Um, so forms um, 
these are different forms essentially that we can review review individuals self and manager assessments as well um, so let's review uh, Jimmy let's review Jimmy have a look at rating him on maybe different, some different skills and competencies so okay as you can see some of this has been been um, conducted but actually delivering some high quality work I actually think that that's been you know really outstanding and this this is against the, the skills gap in terms of uh, what what Jim what Jimmy is um, rating himself at but when it comes to um, let's say increasing productivity in his region, maybe that's gone down a bit in terms of meeting expectations. So you can still see the skill gap um, changing. Uh, so these are role and these can be role and even course slash competency specific um, when it, when it comes to, when it comes to reviewing that. Um, just going to have a look now into succession. So we've, we've gone through an interesting journey so far around um, how it begins more around learning and then setting some goals and, and performance. Let's look more into succession and where we can develop in our career. Obviously success factors is a, um, a hire to retire end to end solution. So it's interesting to have a look at the um, succession org chart. So think about Charles's role um, and at a position level. So he's a director, which we'll would, would show you in a second. Um, which is actually a key position within the organization, hence this little key. Um, and Jimmy, actually, who we were reviewing, and uh, Xander in, in, uh, in Charles's team, um, you can see how far away they are from, from ready to you know, be, the, be the successor uh, in, in the director role. So they think Xander is one to two years, and the system was very smart calculating the, these kind of things around... Um, achievements etc um so one to two years and jimmy's more like three to five years away um so expected to when they're expected to be ready um, so this can identify people give potential matches you can even add um you can even add external um external candidates in here or um you know possibilities in here um, people from the recruitment database you can create candidates from scratch um, it will also contact them to apply for a role for example if Charles is moving elsewhere um, etc so if we look into talent pools next um, that's an interesting area to to talk about next so we can talk about um, groups of employees um, ultimately um, so some high, high potentials, for example. So this is satisfying particular needs or qualification criteria, we should, we should say, to be included in talent pools. So groups of employees against positions. Um, and uh, it, it makes planning more robust around, uh, around the succession piece. So we can see, you know, th these people are ready for, you know, for this kind of, um, you know, these kind of progressions now in, in their particular fields. Um, and these people are like, like we saw with, uh, with Jimmy and Xander there, maybe one to two or three to five years away from that. Um, a talent search, um, a cr or a criteria, um, search and setup can be, can be done here. Um, obviously focusing on matches for uh, people, people with matches, um, compare you can compare individuals here I'm not going to go through that through that totally but we're, um, we're probably good to talk more about development now um, so we're obviously talking about that succession piece now development kind of comes hand in hand with that connecting the story here really we've gone through for employee like I said learning courses um, and in impact it and that obviously impacts development so you can see here what we're on track with again um, but if we look at career worksheets this is manage, management and planning against current role and requirements um, and assessments against other roles in the business so creating goals from creating goals can be done from here um, let's say 
um, controlling costs for, for for Charles. Obviously, something he hasn't really got experience with. So that's you know we can create and develop a goal from here to um, enhance um, expertise around controlling costs. Um, career um, and, and obviously that really helps around the career path, um, identifying the direction of um, of one's career. Um, or su suggesting roles, um, the system recommends certain roles, you know, to individuals. Um, so we've gone through a variety of different um, modules and functionality of success factors, but um, obviously I'm not showing you all the modules, um, as it has huge capability from complete hire to retire for an employee. I haven't shown you Employee Central, which is the core master data um, module, essentially the, the central hub. Um, of, of the system um, or compensation which um, is self-explanatory around bonus around salary, salary increments etc which integrates with payroll um, or jam the social collaboration tool but well, as I said um, success factors has huge capability um, and uh, I hope I've given you a nice insight today into uh, into what it can do So now um, I'm going to hand over to Lionel um, from GSK to talk more about um, their journey and process where obviously success factors was a, a big part of that. So uh, over to you, Lionel. Thank you, Toby. Um, so, so let me just quickly give you a, a, a brief overview of GSK first um, so, so, so we can go to the next slide. Um, the, I mean, we're... we're a global healthcare company, um, science-led global healthcare. So, so, so we really put a lot of, of effort into our R and D uh, and a big focus on uh, you know, innovative ways um, to develop medicines and drugs, etc. Um, what is probably less known is that GSK has actually three businesses. Um, there's a vaccines business. Um, that there's a pharma business, but there's also a consumer healthcare part. Um, and, and so right from the, the get-go, um, you can understand that if we want to have a truly strategic um, approach to training, that means we, uh, we need a solution that works for all these businesses. Um, and that, that, that covers um, well, the development side of people, but also the compliance side. And this is quite heavy on us, um, you know, to, to make sure we, we, we are capable in one single platform, in one single learning system to, to manage both ends. And, and, and that's what we're doing. Um, if you can move to the next one. The, the, we have about 100,000 people around the world, um, but actually, we are managing training for more people than that because um, we also uh, have to make sure um, the complementary workforce, you know, those, those consultants and uh, additional workforce we're bringing in um, are following our, our, our SOPs, they are following our procedures and um, and they know exactly what is expected from them when they, they're on the manufacturing line. So the, the solution covers in reality about 120,000 people across the world globally. So that means more than 150 countries. Um, and that also means several languages um, because training are, are offered in, in local languages most of the time. Um, that means also several millions of training completions over the course of a year. So I'm, I'm sharing that just to say um, we, 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 we have huge numbers and, and a very large population to manage and we're capable of doing so just using that single platform uh, in success factors and, and uh, I think that's that's one of the key aspects. It truly is a global training platform, uh, and it works whether you're a small, a mid-sized company or a very large-sized company, and it will perform equally well 
in all cases. At least that's our experience. Um, the, 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 the type of profiles or personas um, that you'll see on the next slide um, uh, is really our focus um, for, 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 for whenever we try to define what um, the system is allowing to do. So as I said, as a farmer, we clearly very um, focused on the compliance side and making sure our um, well, our operators or our manufacturing operators or our researchers are uh, complying with um, their, their, their license to manufacture. Um, and that means they know the SOPs, they're being told whenever there's, a, there's been a revision for a specific procedure that they need to retrain on before it's becoming effective. Um, and that at all time, you know, we're, we're allowing um, the quality teams and the learning teams to report on um, global compliance for a site or for a region of a product and make sure at all times we can track, you know, who's taking what, um, what training. But that's just one aspect of the platform. It's, it's a very big one. It's a very important one for GSK, but that's just one aspect. Um, we have two other personas we really like to, uh, to focus on, and, and, and those are the salesperson or, or sales force, which is heavily mobile, always on the go, um, hardly ever coming back to the office. And they need to be capable of also, you know, developing their sales, de developing their scientific knowledge about the products um, from wherever they are. Um, and so, so having a system like um, um, we, we, we told you before, having a system that's also mobile accessible is really key for that group of people. Mobile accessible, the content needs to be short because they usually don't have a lot of time. They cannot spend 90 minutes uh, on the training program. It's like five, 10 minutes while they're in, the, in a waiting room um, with, um, you know, waiting for the doctor to receive them or a healthcare professional to see them. So, so they don't have, um, you know, huge periods where they can only focus on training. It's more bite size and, and, and short, very focused access, refresher and things like that. So that was a very, you know, specific customer group we tried to address with the platform. And the last one is the general, you know, person working on their development um, in, the, in the company. Whether you're a new joiner and uh, uh, you need to know what, what, what are the learning path where you have to go through in your first, you know, 10, 15, 30, 90 days while you're on board in your new role or whether you just got a promotion and you're a newly appointed manager um, and then you need to know what are the resources that are made available to you in order to grow in your new management role. And maybe that's acquiring new soft skills, uh, et cetera. So um, for those three groups, when we worked on our learning platform, the, 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 the key driver was always the employee experience. Um, and how can we make sure we drive the adoption of the platform um, and we provide the right tools to our audience? Um, we've created a brand around the learning platform. It's called the Key Brain Campus. So it's really meaningful for, pe for people. They know, um, you know, it, it gives them a sense of development. I'm, I'm going on the campus to learn something new. This, this is becoming a reflex. Whenever I need to, to find some material, I know I can go on the campus. So, so branding it uh, and giving it a, a, an identity was, was a really good move and a really good idea to, to, to increase the adoption. And in the campus, you have um, uh, six key elements. The personalization is extremely important. So people will come back to your um, platform if whatever they find is maintained as is, is being kept fresh. Uh, it's a little bit like <laughs> the Netflix effect. You go back to it because every time you go back to it, there's a new suggestion based on your um, uh, previous viewing history, 
Well, here it's about the same. The personalization comes because you, you're capable of mentioning your areas of interest and the system knows, you know, who are your peers, what have your peers looked at in terms of training and what should be suggested to you next. Uh, search is an integral part of the experience. What you want to enable is that whenever you search for something, uh, it's bringing up relevant records and, and relevant results. So it's very, we've put a dedicated attention to make sure search works um, very quickly and brings relevant records. Um, recommendation and, and collaboration, those are, are, are two key characteristics that we, we touched upon earlier in this web webinar, but essentially um, it's the social aspect of learning as well. When, when, when people find something good, something they like, something that have helped, they want to be able to comment on it. They want to be able to recommend it to their friends or colleagues. They want to be able to rate it and give it a thumbs up or a star. So we've, we've, we've put a lot of attention to make sure this is something that, that will be allowed in uh, the system and also um, um, that helps with the personalization as well because you may say I only want things that have been given three or, or more stars. I'm not interested in the lower rated um, content. Um, and then the last two parts are mobile accessibility. I, I touched on that but this is extremely important today that you know your, your solution is is accessible wherever you are. So if you're in the office, fine. Yeah. I mean, you, you access it through natural browser. Um, but if you're on the move, then, you know, people need to be able to, to, to access to some of, of those training uh, from the mobile phones or, or from their tablets. Um, and this is all supported by success factors. And then you'll see about the campaign and news feed, but this is the same spirit of you know, keeping the, con the, the content fresh. We're, we're aiming at um, highlighting some of the, 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 the content um, depending on the period of the year or a specific event. And, and you know, just recently we, we ran several campaigns about uh, resilience and working re remotely just because of the COVID situation and, and, and supporting those teams who are used to work all together and know how to work from home. So you, you're probably wondering what does it all look like? So, so let, let me help you visualize that a little bit. Um, and you know, this is really, this is a screenshot from last week's homepage. Um, just to tell you, it's, it's quite fresh and that, that's exactly how it looks like today. Um, there's a, a few elements um, that, that you would recognize from, you know, some, some social um, sites you might use or community sites you might use, because that was the intent. You, you wanted to, to make sure people felt and had a sense of um, uh, known territory. This, this would not be something new, but it knew a little bit about um, how, how this, um, this, this learning system would function. So, so saying hello is always a good you know, way to personalize the experience. I, I'm greeted. I find that uh, this is you know, generating some trust um, within the company. And then the first thing I can do is really search because you know, 70 or more percent of um, the interaction will be about searching and finding a relevant course. I have an idea, uh, like you would do today, if you want to, uh, to train on your personal life, uh, you probably go to YouTube as a, as a first go to, you know, environment. Oh, I, I, I'd love to see how I can fix this cabinet. Well, I'll go on YouTube, I'm sure I'll find a tutorial. And the, the idea was really to have that same experience in the company. How do I do something? How can I find something? And then obviously you, you'll be recognized straight away. Um, just beneath the, the search, we also have popular search terms. So we help people with knowing and finding stuff because we can, we can surface what has been searched before. And this is personalized to your department. So if somebody in R&D comes in, you won't see the same 
um, search terms promoted as if somebody else is coming. That's just um, to make sure the personalization and the relevance of the, of the results is tailored to you. Then we have the, the, the focus training. So that's really also to keep things fresh and, and making sure um, people return and know what's, what's highlighted. And then we have a series of um, other areas like um, the groups of skills that you can develop and almost the catalog. So you can develop business skills, you can develop leadership skills, technical skills, each of them bringing you to a subset of a catalog of, of courses you can take. And, and I'm, I'm talking about courses, um, but, but you have to understand um, those courses are a, a blended mix of multiple ways to deliver training. So some of them would be classroom training, but actually a lot of them, um, and, and what we see today is our, our e-learning. So just online classes, online courses, you can, you can participate too. And it's not just online training we've created, it's also online training that exists with our partners, like um, we subscribe to LinkedIn Learning just to get one. And, and this comes true here. So I don't have to go to LinkedIn to find my, my training. I can search from within the campus and if there's a relevant training in LinkedIn, it will show it to me. If there's a relevant training in um, Harvard Managemental, which is another source, then it will find it as well. So it's my real single place um, to find all my relevant training. In terms of personalization, if we scroll down a little bit on the screen, then that's where we, we, we get to the recommendations um, and, and there are several ways the system recommends training to you. It's either based on your interest, so that means you, you just select, uh, you set up a list of topics you're interested in, and then the recommendation shows you the, 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 the newest content based on your interest and also the highest rated content based on your interest. And then you can have more person-to-person -person recommendations, either um, from you to your team members and then from your team to you or from your managers. So manager can push training and recommend training through their um, team members. <coughs> and then the last um, part, I would say, of our homepage is... Um, um, the ability to browse the full catalog because sometimes you just you know want to have the ability to to browse a little bit to look at the catalog again coming back to the next flip experience. Um, sometimes you, you just don't know. You want to flip through the pages until you find something good to watch, something that piques your interest. Well, that's exactly what you can do here, and you have all the abilities. Um, that you would expect, which means you can filter by provider. If I'm only interested by uh, LinkedIn courses, I could, I could filter by that. You can, you can only filter by training type, because I mentioned classroom and online training, but we also have a series of podcasts and a series of books that are made available to people. So if, you, if your preference is to read articles, you would probably filter by books and just look for those resources <clears throat> that are um, books made available. And then finally, um, the, 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 I mean, the last part, in, I, I said in the beginning, one, one, one area that's very key to our business is compliance. So we, we're not forgetting that. And, and there's a section that's just about compliance. So that means you can straight away see what are the training you have to complete by a specific date? Let's say a procedure is becoming effective next week. You'll be able to flag directly that for next week, you have to read the procedure and mark, um, you know, mark it as um, read and understood. So this is where um, some of our, our, our people um, uh, in the manufacturing line would come straight away and, and look at, okay, what do I have to do this week? Or what do I have to do for next week? And how can I you know, straight away jump into the training program? So I would say this part is much more of a push training strategy. Things that 
administrators based on your role or based on some rules have decided to push through to you as opposed to the previous section which were more of a pool approach we let people choose what they do but we help them decide um, offering suggestions etc based on their interests so that's a brief overview um, of the platform something very interesting um, um, is that so we launched the campus um, at the beginning of this year uh, around, around January this year and what we've seen is an incredible uptake of uh, people um, consuming content and, and I think that's really worth um, looking at in, in a little bit more detail so, so, so this is already a little bit old it's, it's, it's results um, back in uh, in april mid-april when we ran some statistics about the usage but you can you can see that be between february and march <coughs> the number of completion of online courses has uh, has, has grown by close to 700 percent um and that's that's really telling that i mean that that, that means people have quickly adjusted to the new reality of, of working remotely. Um, I mean, they had no choice really, but, but, but there, they, there was still a need for them um, to continue their development and, and, and continue to grow in their role. And so, so the shift, the, having a platform allowed us to support that shift to more online training, you know, not in classroom anymore, but, you know, sitting uh, here, but, but, but but what was really great is also the shift to virtual instructor-led. So this type of training is um, similar to a classroom, except you know, your trainer sits in one place in the world and the cohort sits in another place in the world and multiple locations and they can still come together and um, they can still drive very efficient training all together using those tools and systems um, and, and continue to have this experience even beyond the classroom. Because what's, what's also very special about um, uh, our training platform is that it allows some, some, some form of social interaction. So that means um, if you're part of a, a training cohort, you can continue the discussion and continue to discuss about the topic outside of um, the classroom itself. You can you can share questions with the teacher. You can share good resources that you found online. You know, as an addition to what you, you've seen together, or also, and you can be part of an alumni network. You know, once the training has been completed, you know, along with all those who were part of past cohorts. Um, you have the possibility to really reach out to whoever has completed the training and ask questions, find, you know, those specialists, those, those people who are, who have an acute knowledge of the topic and just, and just continue the discussion. So it's way beyond just the pure training, you know, ticking the box. It's creating that culture of finding experts, exchanging information, continuing to contribute to the topic and growing together. And so, yeah, we, we've had a, a very big increase in adoption. Um, and, and one of the, um, you know, the, the, the most adopted uh, uh, program was manage, uh, re, managing, re, uh, I mean, um, sorry, resilience. So, <clears throat> but resilience for managers. So people wanted to know what were the good techniques and tips they could apply um, with their teams uh, to help them uh, uh, stay connected and help them, you know, uh, perform well in, in those tough times. Um, I mentioned classroom training and virtual classroom training, and, and this is actually a very interesting example. This is showing you what does a training program look like in the campus. 
and it's made of modules, as you, as you would ex expect. And those modules have um, maybe several tasks to complete. Maybe you have a pre-read to, uh, to, uh, to check, then a video to watch, and then finally you have uh, a, a virtual instructor lab uh, session. And through a very user, um, easy user experience, you can, you can know at each time where you stand for each of the module. Um, it, it shows you progress, it shows you, it gives you additional lectures um, to go, you know, one step further on the topic. Um, and, and just, I mean, just as an example again, this is the only um, global training that was continued once uh, we were all forced uh, into lockdown. And that was because it, it was capable of the, being delivered through that virtual instructor-led um, um, way. And, and it didn't require people to just sit in together in the same classroom. It was designed from the beginning uh, to, to, to work in that virtual setup. And since then, since March, <coughs> we've transformed most of our leadership training into that format with great adoption, great feedback. People really enjoy it. Um, you know, it, 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 having, I mean, it has so many advantages um, uh, for them. One of, of, of which is they just can you know, do that remotely. They don't have to, uh, to wait for um, a, 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 a session to be uh, planned and, and a seat to be made available in their region, uh, you know, as long as, uh, as the time zone works, that's fine. Um, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the last thing to say about that, that, um, that form of training is that it's very easily also translatable, so, so the programs we run, I, I think I mentioned that in the beginning, we, we, we have, you know, it's a global platform, it's a, it's a global population, we have more than 150 countries, and we, we manage about 24 languages um, in the system. Today, this training program has been translated in 12 languages. So that means also you can very quickly adjust the training offering um, uh, to, to align to your target audience and, 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 your, your, and the preference, the language preference, while still being able to track, you know, who completed what, um, and, uh, and, and what is the, uh, the adoption of the training program. So, I mean, just, just to, um, to wrap up on all of that, this was, a, I mean, a quick overview. Um, of our, of our campus, all, you know, again, all built on six factors, um, all built using the learning components of six factors. Now, the, the question, you know, I, I, you may have, and, and, and definitely a question we had before going on this implementation was, you know, what's, what's the gotchas? What are, you know, the key things to pay attention to? What are the, the, the key? well, success factors that would help us uh, be um, capable of running such a, a, a transformational project. Um, <clears throat> I think of the first, um, uh, I, I said we launched in January this year. Um, it's a two year journey because the, the campus you've seen in this presentation is not how it was designed first. And so that's why the first recommendation is to start small. Because in the beginning, it didn't look like that. It, it was pretty much just um, a discussion forum for classroom participants. And that was it. And it was already 10 times better than um, a, a classic, you know, classroom training because it allowed you to have more interaction with your peers. You know, it allowed you to, uh, to have interaction with the teacher as well. But starting small, um, although it may sound, you know, um, um, very basic, and, and you probably hear that 
a lot, but starting small is really the way to go. Find the one training program or the few training programs that could you know, benefit from this and then deploy that for those training programs and then grow from there. Don't try to do a big bang for the whole company at, at home. Find you know, those uh, relevant teams who, um, who are keen to go with you on that journey. Uh, and, and will be your early adopters, but also your stronger supporters. Um, positioning of the platform in the XA system, well, you know, being clear, uh, because there are some social aspects to it, be clear, you know, that, you know, what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, we, we had to um, make sure people understood how the Keep Growing Campus was being positioned versus um, workplace, for example, which is a, a, a Facebook version for the, the enterprise, and we launched at approximately the same time. So make sure you, you're not being seen as a competitor to, to another tool that you have, but rather as a, as a, as a combined force and something that, that, that provides some um, added value. Um, central con control and governance is about making sure you don't you keep at least in the beginning a, a, a control about who can create groups who can create um pages um and and, and who, who can change those pages and and initially we really made that only from a central team perspective um because well, what we wanted to avoid is um <laughs> that the, the campus becomes the next place where people talk about pets. I mean, that's that's fun and that's nice, but it's yeah, it, it can quickly become, you know, a, a sign that this is a place to go and waste time. And we did not want to have that. We really wanted to show the added value, and so keeping a control about who's who's capable of creating stuff and, and administrating stuff is ex, you know, extremely important. But it comes with the next step, which is supporting the builders. At the same time, as you as you control that, you have to start building your community of builders, your community of experienced designers, that will um, be allowed slowly to uh, start creating content and, and and bringing more content into the platform. And of course, you, you do, when, when you do that, you don't want to rely on the central team to give explanation of, of new support. You, you want to quickly work on a change program that allows people to self-train and self-adopt the tools and start building while you know still following the, the, the guidance. So it's a it's a very hard balance to get to, but it's it, it was key to our success. You know, we were able to quickly take a train the trainer approach and let people you know learn by themselves. Um, while keeping some side of, of governance about it. And, and that was you know, how we could all that organically grow. Um, user experience, uh, I've, I've said it you know, a number of times, but this is really our focus, making sure um, um, the, the user journey, you know, whatever uh, users are doing with the platform, it's easy, uh, it's accessible with very few clicks. Um, um, and we, we continuously review that and, and make tweaks. So the screen you've seen today is actually not the same screen when we launched, and it's definitely not the same screen as we had one year before, just because we're taking on feedback on a regular basis, I mean, on a continuous basis, really, and um, you make those tweaks to make sure the user experience is the best it can be. Content partners, I, I, I've spoken to LinkedIn about LinkedIn learning, but this is, this is really essential. Um, don't expect you'll be able to create all the content yourself. Um, we, we, we've, we've tried that and, and it, it's possible and sometimes it's, it's desirable when the content is very specific, very specialized. But especially in the, in the, in the, in the area of, of um, skills building, there are plenty of content partners that can offer pre-made, pre-built content with the highest quality criteria. And this is what really you, you, you should go for. Uh, and so finding the right partners, fi finding the right content providers um, helps you accelerate 
um, your, 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 your offering. And again, don't forget, um, people will come back because there is content that they consume. If you have a great platform, but we don't have any content, they will just come and, and, and once or twice look at it. But then if it keeps on being always the same single course that's being recommended, they will not come back and your, your adoption will suffer. Um, KPIs, I, I don't think I need to elaborate a lot on that, but you know, measuring the uh, adoption, measuring what's working, what's not working, what are the pages that are consulted, what are the contents that are being um, completed, and what is less accessed, what is you know, less liked is important. And so thinking about that upfront will, um, will help you make those tweaks, make those uh, adjustments. Um, and then, yeah, last, last recommendation is, is make sure you find a strong partner um, uh, when you do your implementation. We partnered with Talent Team. Um, we, we even co-developed some, some of the solutions together and we really, you know, um, worked in these hands in hand to, to create the, the best user journey. So, so, so it's not just, you know, having them as a resource provider, but really as a partner, they can advise us on, you know, what would work, what wouldn't. And in turn, we can feed our um, uh, well requirements, but also suggestions back to the team, and, and have that hand-in-hand um, -hand relationship that that builds the product together. So, hopefully, all of that you know helps you get through a similar journey, and, and, and clearly, you know, was successful for us as a, as an implementation, as a and as a deployment for. Um, for this learning platform um, called the Keep Brain Campus. So with that, I think we can um, open for Q&A. Um, edit, Toby. Yeah, thank you. Thank Very, you, Lionel. Thank you, Lionel. That, that was such an interesting and uh, an inspirational uh, story there for everybody on the line, I'm sure. Um, we might just open up to Q&A. Feel free to drop any uh, questions you might have into the chat um, and, and we'll do, Toby, uh, Lionel and myself, will do our best to, uh, to answer them if we can. Um, I just, like some of the stuff you were talking about there, Lionel, is just so interesting. I, I think um, it's, it's just great to see how you were able to enable your people to make such productive use of their time, especially people who are generally on site and they get pulled up. They're not really sure what to do with their time at the very start. So I thought, thought it, was, um, it was great that they had that, that they can, well, for starters, you need to get in there and, and get your mandatory training done. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm guessing it made you popular with the compliance people, you know. <laughs> so it, it, it made us popular with the compliance people. Another, I mean, big thing is the onboarding experiment. So onboarding is, is, is really critical. Mm. Um, um, in your retention, I mean, uh, especially you know, today, people may just leave your company if if your onboarding experience is terrible, yeah. then they won't hesitate. Okay, yeah. So, so having a place for them to go to and straight away know what they have to do, what are the first training courses they can make, you know, maybe who are the people they should meet first. Mm. All of that is actually also part of you know, it's one area of our platform. Um, and it really helps with retention and help increase that 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 onboarding experience. Yeah, and I think that like that that blended learning as well. I think we've all been that soldier in years gone by where we get just sent a bunch of links and we basically have to sit in front of a desk for days on end looking at videos or whatever. And um, that 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 you know what you were talking about that they can dip in and pretty much pick out the stuff that they might be in the mood for that day, you know, or mix it up. Yeah. A bit of a podcast, a bit of this, definitely. And that, uh, you know, virtual instructor-led learning is very interesting as well. You know, in supporting that, that human element, like, gosh, I just want to talk to a human over, over the last few months uh, <laughs> has been really important. And I imagine for those people onboarding as well, like that, that's really, really, really important for them. Um, I thought it was interesting as well, you know, as you say, it ties into the stuff Toby was showing us as well in terms of development, you know, um, I spoke yeah. about, about the challenges that are faced in particular very specific skill sets. Uh, we can look in terms of 
what Toby showed us in terms of development. So we may have somebody kind of junior, maybe they're doing IT at night, you know, uh, perhaps we can talk, talk them through their development goals that we saw there and, and match how, how, what can they do on the learning platform that could help them bring it in, in to those. And maybe they do end up in that talent pool that we spoke about. Maybe they're in there mm -hmm. now in, in our junior data scientist pool. Um, so it's yeah. all really, really uh, important stuff for helping you transform. Um, I see there's a, a question about type and amount of resources that have been required um, over today. So, so, so I can start maybe with a piece of answer, and then Toby probably you can you can pick on or, or edit. But so, so our yep. journey, um, I mean, first because we're large, we're global, so that there's a, a dimension of size that needs to be taken into account. So no two projects would be similar. But yeah. um, in, in, in terms of type of resources, I mean, you definitely need to have um, somebody with expert knowledge of the platform. It's kind of, a, I mean, it's very easy to configure. Um, so, so you need somebody that can guide you to the options um, but you know, it's it's usually not a long piece um, uh, to do. Uh, to, to, the real key is to have your somebody that can represent your customers. I mean, it it sounds <laughs> cheesy a little bit, but if you if you try to do it, I'm I'm I, I don't know if that that was evident, but I'm coming from IT, so I'm, I sit in the IT side of GSK. Um there's no way we could have implemented that just by ourselves, looking at just the tool and making those decisions. It's very important that you have business stakeholders taking part of, of, of that setup of deciding, you know, what is the behavior you want to set for your system. So I would say a six factors expert, you know, somebody that knows the system and know what's, or, you know, what can be configured or not. The business stakeholders um, are, are essential. And then we, um, <clears throat> we had um, a, a team, you know, a few testers. I think testing the solution, testing your implementation to make sure um, uh, the user experience is good uh, and the adoption will be there. And the testers, uh, funnily, were people who had no idea what the platform was about. So they were <laughs> very new and they, they, they were there just to, they were given a scenario. We were telling them, okay, you you have to find something in data science um, that takes 30 minutes or less for you uh, to go through. And we're left with no instructions further than that business problem. And we were just looking at them going through the screens and seeing if it was easy for them or not. So that's the, you know, the type of, of, um, of resources we needed during the project. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say there's a lot on the content side as well. You know, that's, that's yep. a big job to identify your best best sources of content, the specific ones, all the stuff around the role definition and what's mandatory, what's what's recommended. All that is is a very large job. And I suppose mm -hmm. there's the the resources as well around the, the the change, the communications, even your your like your internal comms team are really really important. Yes. Um, uh, just to get, help you with your, you know, you can have your project team, but they'll ha really help you about getting your messages across to to, to, to your people and um, how you need to. So, so it's, it's just, just to, to wrap up on that, I, I think it's a, a typical example of what you explained earlier on in your presentation, Edith, about the, 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 the format of HR systems projects. It's not about the system, actually. Yeah. It's all what goes around it. So, yeah. so selecting the right content, selecting your governance, setting up. So, so we did not have learning experience designer. You know, we had a lot of people who knew how to build classic training, mm -hmm. but having this mindset shift to, okay, I still need to achieve the same experiments, but, but remotely is a completely different experience. And so it's yeah. all the business side that really took yeah. most of our effort and energy. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that that business process transformation, like I was talking about all the stuff around it uh, is really, is really important. It's like um, even, even the managers being able to coach their people 
So we're talking there and they're one to ones with their people. They need to be encouraging them to use the social learning that's on there as well, mm -hmm. not just a tick box, you know. So, well, how do you get managers to do that? Well, we need to communicate to the managers then. It's a totally different message. And there's a lot of effort that goes in around that. But um, absolutely worth it in the long run, as, as you've yeah. demonstrated there. Do you know what I mean? It's key yeah. for adoption. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's all about adoption, isn't it? And, and yeah. I, I really liked, you know, when you talk about that stickiness now, and, and that, that's the real thing they talk about in user experience, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, it's got to be sticky. So I really like your analogy of the Netflix effect. You know, um, it needs to be fresh and new. Um, we absolutely need to make sure they're going in there, not least to make sure they've done the latest version of the SOP training, uh, but also uh, to, to keep them engaged. And it's, so important to keep that momentum going because if they have mm -hmm. a bad experience one time then they, they you know it erodes it a bit so absolutely it's great to keep that engagement going so there's always fresh content even if it's not from the learning team it can be from their colleagues or ac across the world in your case as well interesting okay so will we have we any more questions at all from the floor no no nope. any wrap-up comments or anything from toby or erlina well, it's been it's been a pleasure and really interesting seeing how the overall picture of change adoption technology and obviously the story at GSK uh, you know brings that to life so yeah it's been a pleasure thank you very much everybody so um, if you have any further questions offline feel free to contact us um, you'll you'll always find us on LinkedIn um, um, but uh, Toby you've got a slide there the next one and um, which has our contact details on it um if anyone wants to take an old screenshot there you'll have them handy um okay so thank you very much for joining have a good day thank you bye everyone thanks bye